This is Live from the Table, the official podcast of the world-famous Comedy Cellar, coming at you on Sirius XM 99, Raw Dog, and wherever you get your podcasts, here with Noam Dorman, the hello, owner, hello, owner hello, of the hello. Comedy Cellar. And by the way, uh, Noam's like uh, starting to tweet quite a bit, I've noticed. I- I'm going to stop. It's, it's a bad habit. Okay, yeah, well, I, I, I enjoyed listening, you know, reading your tweets, but it'll be sad to see you go. Uh, <laughs> Peril Ashen Brand is here. Do you tweet, Peril? No. She's a, she loves a good meme, though. I, she, I'm on Instagram only. She literally, Periel is, is literally sees the world through a meme. <laughs> well, that's probably not a good way to see the world. She was like, where'd you get that from? Did you see that? And then she sent me, a, I said, you have to back that up. She'll send me a meme. <laughs> <laughs> Instagram is generally speaking a little friendlier, but. Unless you're talking about Israel Palestine, and then it becomes everybody's acrimonious as Twitter. And you know when she knows it's a reliable meme? No. When it rhymes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are here with uh, Periel's niece, Shiley. What's your last name? Ron. Shiley Ron. Put, put, give her the mic, Periel. She she doesn't look a whole lot like Periel. It's a long story. So she's not your niece. She is my niece. Do you, I worked out. We can get into the history. Of and it she later. is uh, Israeli, uh, as is most of Periel's family. Mm. Um, and Periel's husband too. Periel recently remarked on Instagram. Should I should I divulge in front of, of your name? Of course, name? it's on Instagram. Well, she said there's nothing. You haven't lived until you fucked an Israeli soldier. Or something Jesus like Christ, damn! I asked you if I could say it. My son is here. Oh, sorry. Jesus Christ! I just said, can I say it? I I was thinking more about Shai Lee than than maybe, your son. Maybe the Palestinians are right. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, the reason why I've called us here today, and well, I, you did post it on Instagram. What's the matter with you? There aren't ten years old looking at my feed on Instagram. Well, you don't know. Why that. would you say that? All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Go I ahead. would answer if Manny weren't in the room. Um, well, you, Noam has let it. Noam has told us that he lets Manny pretty much watch what he wants. Well, that's a, that's his business, though. I don't need uh, you're to right. be involved in that nonsense. Okay, so I said to Noam, I have a proposition, but I really only want to do it if you're actually interested. And most of the things that I ask Noam, if he's interested, that come from me, he generally says no. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> But Shiley was coming here, and she's a student at Harvard, and she was also a spokesperson in the IDF. And um, I thought that she's been she's been doing a lot of work at Harvard, and she has a really important and I think interesting perspective about what's going on right now. And she was just interviewed by the New Yorker about all the anti-Semitism, although she didn't let them use her name. So I'm sorry to out you. <laughs> Um, Thanks. She's like she's like a she's like a walking. Uh, 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 we're all collateral damage here. <laughs> walking target. She's yeah. She's unbelievable. Well, I mean, it doesn't matter now. But I mean, what are they going to do? Go put her name back in the article? I don't think. I don't think it's they who did want to use the name. She's the one who wanted to keep her name private. Yeah, I know. That's what I so just said. So now people will read the article and they'll know who said it. It's fine. She's got a pretty public persona there anyway. But um. Well, why don't you ask her some questions? We can we can cut the um, we can cut that out of the, the podcast. Okay, all right. So, well, you why don't you why don't you do it, Perel? Since so you you know better what it is to ask her because you're aware of her. So she she's interviewed about the current spate of anti-Semitism at Harvard. Well, I mean, there's rampant and I don't know if you've been following the news lately. But that's but, but that, okay. But before we do that, just tell us a little bit about, bit about yourself. You're how old? I'm 25. Put the mic closer to you. 25 you and, and your um, undergraduate there? I'm an undergrad, yeah. And, and what are you studying? I'm studying economics and psychology. Economics and psychology. Yeah. And uh, what, what's your general political point of view like on, on economics? Are you like a Friedman type or you're, you're left wing? What, what, what? Mm, I would say on economics, I lean a little bit more left. More left. Yeah. So you're like anti-capitalist or? No, definitely not. I believe in the free market. I just think that there are some market inefficiencies that um, governments need to get involved and solve. And um, one, of the, one of our regular guests here has been Tyler Cowen, the economist. You know Tyler Cowen, the economist? You don't know him? So he's like, a, I think, a pretty libertarian economist. All right. So, so you're not a person of the right. No. Politically, you generally lean left also? Yeah, center left. Center left. But before all the stuff with Israel happened, were you sympathetic to like the social justice movement, the 
the words of violence movement, the the gender, uh, all that, all the stuff that people call woke or progressive. Would you say you were part of that progressive? So there's certain things that I, of course, was a part of, and certain things that that I wasn't. I'm f- very much for abortion, for example. Um, I believe that women should have rights, and I'm very much pro that. So you're so a radical. <laughs> <laughs> These days, I'm a radical. It's crazy. <laughs> no, but, but okay, we'll be sure. Right, but I mean, in terms of the things like uh, that, sp- I'm liberal. That, that, pe- yes. that people shouldn't have, that pe- that 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 f- speech shouldn't be so free. That people have the right to complain about what other people say. That people should be fired for things that they've said. All well, the things you know, the things that everybody's been arguing about basically for, since like 2016. I think I think I would place myself. Um, I'm not American, so for me, these debates are less critical. But I would say that I do believe in free speech, but I do think that there has to be like limitations. For example, if someone says something that's violent, if someone says something that's racist, and I know it's not very <laughs> normal these days, but if someone says that something that is anti-Semitic, I think it should all like I'm very much against that being free speech. So. And uh, and and if, have you have given any thought to like how to how to determine whether something is racist, how to determine where something is anti-Semitic? I think it's a very complicated question with a very which has some simple aspects to it. Why is it complicated? Because when something is said, the person who says it might have a different intention from what the person that from what other people hear. But if someone is saying something that is either a call for violence de facto, like what's happening on the ground like to incite violence inciting violence that's that's always that's a red line or if someone's saying something like the jews control the media which are things that have been said on harvard like (coughs) anonymous chats then i think yeah that's something that's a little bit more problematic so if if i have a if i have a chat and i get caught saying listen i think the jews are really uh you know they have a lot of influence in the media whenever you know something that implies the jews control the media what what would you do to a person like that you would have them expelled fired no i think that i think the person needs to have a conversation and we need to chat with this person and say listen some of the statements you're making make other people around you feel uncomfortable and i it gets much worse like people have said if you support israel you are 100 percent a villain and death to jews like these things are crazy People that are calling from the river to the sea. They're saying, we want Jews to be eradicated from Israel. Eradicated from Israel. These are very clear things that are being said. It's not a a gray line. They're anti-Semitic and and clear. So what I think should be done is I think everyone that calls for these things needs to have a conversation with their resident dean, for example. And they need to have an understanding of, wait a second, these things make some students uncomfortable. When you're yelling intifada on the street, there are students here who have family members who have experienced a uh, suicide bombing. Yeah. So that's the connotation of intifada. If someone would yell intifada down the street in Israel, many people would, you know, perhaps go and hide because it's not a normal thing to yell. So I think, yeah, I think these things need to be considered very carefully. And I think students that endorse these this types of language need need to have a conversation with with like with some member of the Harvard community, because I don't know if I want to study in those classrooms with students that want me dead and have said so clearly. So then the last question before, and then we'll get to the, to the, to the heart of the matter. Do you ever stop to think that if everybody just kept it to themselves because they knew they get expelled, so, so everybody just hides the way they feel, that we wouldn't know how people feel and that we that there's some benefit in knowing yeah i i can see the benefit in knowing how people feel but would you want l- let's just give a different example would you let's say there's a person next to you that really wants you like wants to chop off your head right now he's sitting on the subway and all he's thinking about is that he wants to chop off your head would you want to know that like do you think that should be like like I think, in my opinion, that information, like, if this is only their thoughts, it should be kept quiet. Because if they're calling for very violent things, then why should they, why should they be allowed to say that? Because the next step from making... Just think about it psychologically. I'm not an expert on this, but someone says something. If they're saying it, if they're writing it, 
then what's stopping them from doing it? Like the moment you make a thought public, and we all have crazy thoughts, the moment, not those types of thoughts, like I don't think about killing people, but people have different difficult thoughts. If someone, the moment you make it public, you put it in the sphere of what's possible to the world. You make it known to the world. And then what it's already known to the world, what's stopping you from like acting on it? That's like my thought. Of uh, but the problem is that, um, for instance, in Israel, you have these uh, right-wing settler types who are saying similar things now, uh, at least I read about it in Haaretz from time to time, about wanting to, this is our chance, we're going to get all the Palestinians out, we're going to take the entire land, Eretz Yisrael, back. Basically a, a river to the sea mirror image there. And uh, I hate that they say that. I, I'm pretty sure you hate it too. Um, but it never occurred to me they don't have a right to say it. That, that's, uh, that's, what they, that's what they advocate, you know? What are you going to do? Anyway, all right, so... What uh, is he making noise? It's okay. Because he's gonna he's gonna friggin' get it. Isn't he's fine? But. Isn't it different though to be on a college campus and say those kinds of things, and so that other students actually feel unsafe? Oh, Periel. No, um. Mm -hmm. I, I, I problem is that we've lived now for five years or longer of people using that phrase. I feel unsafe to shut down every garden variety opinion that they disagreed with. Uh, our friend Coleman Hughes, basically Ted didn't want to um, broadcast his Ted talk because people claimed it made them feel unsafe. And this is the same thing? Yes, it's the same thing. W words are words. As, as, as she said, there is a, there's a limit for incitement to violence. Mm-hmm which is a legal um, standard that's recognized in the law. And other than that, in the law, now Harvard can have its own rules. In the law, there, is, there are no rules about hate speech. And um, as we've seen, it becomes impossible to figure out. We saw during COVID where people were saying that they thought the, the uh, COVID started in China or, or the you know, from a lab in China. And people in the New York Times are saying this is racist. And Twitter was not uh, allowing people to write it. And I mean, there's also thing. Anyway, I don't want to get sucked into that whole speech, Bob. You're entitled to these opinions, of course, and you're not alone in these opinions. I, I find the whole unsafe thing to be a, um, a big open loophole for people to use. If you tell people there's a feeling unsafe exception, you're going to guarantee yourself that people are going to start characterizing things they don't like as making them feel unsafe. But there's a difference here. Go ahead. And I think the difference is that you can have political opinions that are different. But I think when you're calling for an intifada, and the literal translation is like to shake off, to get rid of. So let, let, let's intifadas are, have been... Um, where there was, you know, anything from uprisings, anything from, from rock throwing and where people were injured, whatever it is, to the second intifada where it was a basically a similar kind of outcome to what we saw on October 7th, but just spread out in many days. Uh, buses blown up, uh, children's things blown up, uh, uh, people, babies and, and, and civilians murdered left and right over the course of, I don't know how long it was, a year or so, a year and a half, maybe longer. Um, so that was so that's what the intifada is. And intifada is really, um, in my opinion, responsible for it's the inflection point where Israeli politics turned to the right and has stayed to the right. Israel was pretty left wing, pretty optimistic about a peace process, uh, was pretty much behind um Barack and and uh and the Clinton process and all that and Oslo, and then with the second intifada you really saw the right wing in Israel take over and hasn't uh, relinquished really control for, for since then. So this was the psychological change. So anyway, yeah, if people call for an intifada, that, that, um, that, that could be... When they're saying bring the intifada here, one solution, intifada revolution. All right, well, leave, leave, okay, so let's leave aside the argument about free speech. I don't think uh, I... Yeah, I think, I think another thing that's really hard is beyond the free speech, just the feeling that People don't want to look you in the eyes as an Israeli and don't want to have a conversation. And I think that's kind of where it crosses the line for me 
where I feel like we've let this narrative go too far. Like we've let this narrative stop us from having really productive, interesting conversations that are important because their assumption is that I, as an Israeli who served in the IDF, am not in favor of Palestinian self-determination, which I am. I am very much in favor of Palestinian self-determination, but they don't even take the time to have this one-on-one -on -one to ask me these questions to see that maybe our political opinions are much closer than in certain areas than they thought. And that's what's scary to me, that people are just, like, blocking. The so, so tell us so tell us what is going on at Harvard. Now, you have some, you have some uh, posts that we can look at. Mm -hmm. but, um, should, you, you want to? Yeah. But, but just tell us what, what it's like and, and, and what's changed. You didn't, you know, did, what? So is this your post? No, this okay. is, I don't, I don't use this app. It's called SideChat. It's an anonymous app for Harvard students. So to be on the app, you have to be a registered um, student. Uh, stu so you have to like use your Harvard email. And students have put some really terrible so, things so Let me read it because not everybody sees the video. It says, uh, Harvard, I've, I've never been more scared to be a Jew. Heard people talk in the dining hall saying, get rid of them all. Jews never did anything good for the world. And they're posting this. Basically, all students can read this. So anyone who's a Harvard student can read this. Yeah. Um, and it's it's anonymous. It's anonymous, so you get a lot of things on there. Yeah, you can. Right, what, what else? So here you have a beheaded baby, just like a. Oh my God. Baby and. Wait, but this is so. But this is this somebody? Oh, it says number one. It's like it's like it's supporting the beheaded so baby. So essentially, the numbers are um like, the numbers are the net at added so if you can press up or press down so like in this case you could have like let's say three people press up and two people press down so you have a net one that's what it shows it's like the plus uh, well they do that with polls that biden is yeah. plus five they, they take his negative minus one. so <laughs> it was a close call here but you don't know how many people oh no, but i it, see a, a baby and a shirt what is this it's a beheaded baby it's a beheaded baby so the idea is like somebody says, let's let's take a poll on how you feel about beheaded babies, and some people were for it, and some people yeah. were against it. Yeah, this is unbelievable. Continue, continue. What's next? So this is after we did the table. Um, we did like a table thing to commemorate um, the hostages. Uh, Shabbat table. Um, you can with empty chairs. Yeah, you can go to the next one. Um, oh, is there anything I can I should read there? No, it's no, okay. okay. We can continue. Um, this one says, the fact Israel took pride in the bombing of the hospital and then saw the attention it's receiving, so they quickly diverted to blaming the PLO or Hamas, is crazy. For a government with so much wealth, the propaganda is so jank. What's jank? Uh, it must be a new term that the kids are using. It's like garbage. Uh, junk. And then it says, rest in peace to all the martyrs of Palestine. Um, there's, there's some pretty bad ones. I would imagine those martyrs include anybody that was... Killed uh, perpetrating the the October seventh acts. Yeah, so I have to say I am not the person who screenshotted these because I'm not on the app. Um, so these were sent to me. There's a few more, um, like a lot of them saying that they've like here you see someone saying that if you're still pro Israel, you're a villain and need to stay away from me. Um, self defense, my guy Israel is hunt hunting a rabbit with a cannon. Um, okay, the, these are more um, these are okay legitimate things yeah. to say. Right? There's there's some, there's some really bad ones that I've chosen not to share here because I think we're also yeah. There's also some other things that are going on in terms of through the Harvard um, administration that we're talking about. Can I ask where you personally where, draw the line between criticism of Israel, even if it's unfair criticism? And what you would regard as anti-Semitism. So if someone says, get them all, that's clear anti-Semitism, for example. Or gotta get them all. Um, if someone says, let them cook, which was one of them, I think that's clear anti-Semitism. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you say there's some things that are worse, but I can't, I can't make you talk about them. But obviously the things that are worst are the things that make the, the case most... Uh, yeah, I, I just said let them cook, for but, example, was a really difficult one. This was posted on the Sunday, so not the Saturday, the day after, while there was still fighting going on, someone posting let them cook. 
Um, someone posting, what did you think decolonization looked like? Vibes, essays, papers, losers. So that's the narrative. Unbelievable. The Can I read this one without the? Yeah. Y'all say the rhyme with me. Harvard Hillel is burning in hell. Harvard Hillel is burning in hell. They got funded by Epstein as well and support genocide that they will tell. Hillel being the uh, campus Jewish. That rhyme really makes it hard for yeah. you, right, Perel? <laughs> so, so like I'm, 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 I'm like I'm sharing this, and I, and I think like about what it takes. I. Like, I think how h difficult it is for me as a student who is at the core, I believe in, like, h core human values. So when I think, when I hear about Palestinians dying, I mourn them, too. Of course. Like, I'm not, I don't celebrate the death of Palestinians. I don't. I think it's terrible. Uh, and when there's students here who are celebrating and when I say celebrating, they are <coughs> dancing and celebrating with smiles. Yeah, I, I the had, death of Jews. It hurts. I absolutely. I had had the thought, and then I think my son Manny wants to ask a question. But um, that uh, one of the reasons I I am comfortable saying that this is anti-Semitism rather than um, deep political disagreement with Israel is uh, uh, related to what you just said, which is that in in any in any conversation with civilized people, even right-wing Israeli, right? I mean, uh, you know Israelis uh, uh, better than I do, but I know them pretty well, that uh, if you're having a conversation with civilized people, civilized Israelis, not, I mean, we have our own civilized as well, but not, when it comes to the subject of Palestinian, innocent Palestinians dying, every decent person knows to say, Look, I understand it's terrible that they're dying, but and and then some people might say, but we have no choice, or they do, or human, you know, they have, they'll, they'll explain why they feel, but no one will ever think that it's okay, and they understand they look like a monster if they were to say, ah, good, I'm glad, I'm glad they're dying, or or or, or yeah, and what we're seeing here is that people don't even feel the social pressure. To, for that speed bump to say, listen, of course it's terrible to see these Jewish babies die, but you have to understand how the Palestinians feel. They don't even say that. They ask this woman, Reiner Workman, on, on TV, like, do you feel bad for the Jewish children? And then she wouldn't say yes. And, and you see that in, in this as well. You, they, and it, again, it, so they've totally dehumanized. That's really what it is. I mean, this is all bigotry. It's, it really, it's a cliche, but it's true. When you, when you, I mean, how did the Nazis do it? The Nazis had to do it by dehumanizing the Jews. Exactly. And this is actual dehumanization, where, where people don't feel the need either internally or even to look uh, 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 um, not like a monster in mixed company, just to be polite, even if you don't mean it, just to act like it. They don't even feel the need to act like it in front of others to say, well, good for them. I don't care. Praise to the moderates. You know, let's, 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 let's put up a picture of the, yeah. the paragliders. So how is that? It has to be anti-Semitism. I've never heard that before in any war ever. I mean, it could be that if you go back to World War II, people might have been selling, you know, I, I don't yes, know. How, yes, the, pro the, pro the, probably, the, probably the attitude about the Japanese in World War II was at that point. Um, actually, I don't know that. I mean, we, we know the movie Oppenheimer that there was considerable uh, um, uh, worry about civilian lives dying among some people, but I'm sure there was such hatred at that point that they had dehumanized the Japanese. They say things like, there is no such thing as civilian Israelis. Yeah, That's what was posted after we did the table. And we had sp spoken publicly about this being for human lives. There's Thai people that are held hostage. There's Germans. There's Americans that are held hostage. And they, they write, there is no such thing. I, I think they're referring to the universal, because everybody in Israel has to be exactly. in the army. So yeah, I, I well, guess that's what they mean by What it. does that have to do but with a baby? A I, I'm just baby. saying, I, I, I assume that that's what they're talking exactly. about. Exactly. That's what they talk that about. That is what they're talking about. Manny has a question. Manny, come over here. Come, don't hit the, don't hit the, uh, <coughs> okay, don't hit the cliche. Come here. Don't hit the tripod. Hi, Bob. 
Come on, come on. There, there's an episode of The Odd Couple where, where he takes his son on the photo shoot. And he gives him, uh, Edna, don't hit the tripod. Don't hit, <laughs> and she hits the tripod. Come, come sit down. So, so it's my son, Manny. Now, listen, my son, Manny, is a loose cannon. I never know what he's going to say. And um, anyway, but, but uh, so he's, he's a 10-year-old boy. But, and he's, but he's 10 years old, but not any normal 10 years old. He's studying cal- uh, algebra. He, he's teaching himself algebra. He's teaching me algebra, but That's too. still pretty good for 10 years so, old. So... Um, you need it, Perry. So, 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 I don't know. Do, do you actually have a question you want to ask? I, I have a story I want to tell. Okay, go ahead. Is it a long story? We don't have time no, for a long story. No, it's like it's pretty short. Okay, go ahead. Um, in middle school, it's about yeah. in middle school, I I have a friend, and he and me and him were having a conversation about what's going out on in Israel. It was close to. It was like. Two weeks after October seventh, and um, he and he was talking about that Israel should not attack Hamas because there's going to be a lot of civilian damage in Palestine, which is and of course there will be, but if they don't attack Hamas, then Hamas is just going to attack them again, over and over, un- until there is no more. So that's what you want to say? Yeah, it's a short story. <laughs> Not a story. <laughs> it's a short story. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do you have any questions about? So, so here's the question. Do, do you have you have you felt in school anything about any kind of thing about being Jewish or anything like that? Or you you are you? No, we just kind of ignore it. You kind of ignore it. Good. Right. Well, I, Shali, where is this coming from? Uh, mostly Muslim students. Mostly just just. All different types of students. Where's this coming from, primarily? So it's coming from Muslim students, from other students that believe very much in this like social justice group. A um, lot of queer students. Um, That's uh, amazing, right? The 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 I, I don't mean to, but the the idea that every, I mean, it's, everybody knows is that the queer students are taking up the cause of the corner of the earth, which still lynches queer people Mm -hmm. and that there are so many queer people from gaza who are living under asylum in In israel Israel. yeah that it's it 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 boggles the mind i mean what does it bring out it brings out first of all the power of ideology you know ideology it is i guess it's like religion i don't know but it really is behind so many of the atrocities of the world and this intersectional ideology that's really what it is that a queer person is the ally of quote unquote the brown people and the anti colonialists and this trumps even a kind of common sense way but they how could they be the good guys if they would kill you because you're queer um it is, in, it is in its own way an analog to how could they round up the Jews and put them in camps? Like, these were their neighbors. This is the blinding of ideology. Uh, for, for all these reasons, I'm not... I, I, I'm, I'm pained that you have to go through it, that anybody has to go through it. I'm pleased, and I think it was necessary, that this rock has been lifted and that we're actually seeing what obviously has been there for quite a long time. And many, many people, many people I argued with on this podcast, Periella had been denying that what was going on in the progressive world was extreme hate and uh, open to anti-Semitism. I had been saying for a long time that I thought that progressivism had become really a way where hateful people had dressed up their hate as righteousness. And that's really the vibe I was getting all the time, that if they could, because they were hungry to find somebody who did something wrong. And then once they had him, they wanted him fired. They want, it didn't matter if they apologized. It didn't matter if they didn't mean it. it, it, it and they wanted to ruin them and, and spit on them. And, whatever. and I said, well, this is, this is a, a dark human instinct that's coming out. This is not the instinct for brotherly love that they pretend it is. It's actually the opposite. 
And now we're really seeing it in a way that I think makes it become indisputable, where this ideology is now cheering babies being dismembered. I mean, there's one story, this woman, this 90-year-old woman who saw her grand, I can't even talk about it, her granddaughter raped in front of her. And, you know, and, and, and then, and she, did you see the video of it? She says, I wanted to stop playing in my head. I wanted to stop playing in my head. This woman, this is how she has to end her life. Um, that people are cheering this. Yeah, they are. Is, it, it shows what this movement has been about. No, what, what do you think? I saw a video today. Somebody, uh, somebody was tearing down the posters of, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, hostages. You know, this was in New Jersey. It was in Montclair, New Jersey. And somebody came over with a camera and said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And they're like, please don't film me. Please don't film me. Well, you were, you were tearing down those posters. Why? We, basically exposing for the world to see these two young ladies that were tearing down a poster in New Jersey. Is I'm, that... I'm for that. You're, you're for that? Okay. You're not? Well, um, look, I have no sympathy for these young women, but do you think that... If, if if I saw if you were commit if somebody was beating up somebody on the street yeah uh, and somebody filmed them and I said yeah good that's a criminal but do you think to set loose a potential mob against people that can't be controlled against people tearing down the posters against people tearing down the posters that I, might that the punishment might ultimately be excessive I, I I mean if somebody were to kill somebody tore down the posters I would say that person who killed them should go to jail you I mean it's not an excuse to to we have we have legal rules about what can be answered with what in terms of violence, but the idea that we would be worried to respect the Private. identity or the yeah. privacy of the person, you know, tearing down the posters. Well, again, this is typical. Like, if, if, if in, on what planet, we, we, had, we had situations where, I don't know, the, the most, you know, innocuous insult of a, a black person was treated as a national issue, you know, a national issue. So, but you so, were against that, I think. You were against... No, but I'm saying that, that, that these same people are now worried about somebody who's tearing down pictures of... Posters. You're not allowed to tear the, the posters down. And we're presuming they're, they're up in a place where they're allowed to be up. And we know why you're tearing it down. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have no problem with that being publicized. I, 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 at least I don't think I do. Yeah, go ahead, Manny. What were the posters about? No, these are posters of, of some of the people that were taken hostage in Gaza. They're 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 posted and they're posted a lot in New York City, but else outside of New York as well. Um, uh, and, and they say just to call they're attention, they're not real. They're, yeah, I mean it's it's an, well, I, I, it's, it's an act of aggression. I mean, it's certainly. Uh, I understand, but I I just was wondering whether there's potential danger in. In, 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 in calling forth the mob, as it were, against people that do this sort of I don't thing. As much as I have no sympathy for people right, that right, do this no, sort I of thing. I understand that. I don't think that it's calling forth a mob. I think it's exposing these people for what they are. There was a woman on the Upper West Side, which is like the most Jewish neighborhood in New York, probably, who was like a nanny. And who wants your nanny to be like ripping down posters of kidnapped babies? I mean, that's sick, right? These people are doing this in broad daylight. They have no fear, no shame. They're proud of themselves. It's kind of crazy because people don't tear down posters of missing cats. <laughs> it's true. Right. But do, do you dogs. think? I mean, you, uh, you, it, it is it me? is different in the sense that, to be fair, well, not not because I'm sympathetic. That's sympathetic to them, but it's it's an obvious point that when you have a poster of a missing cat, you're hoping that somebody will see your cat and, find and return it. The poster of a missing children in in New York is not about maybe you might see this no, but child. It's, but it's a it's about it's a political flyer in some way, and 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 maybe you could say it's a it's a uh, unfair not unfair, but it's a kind of political flyer. Which, if if it was reversed, I could see why it got under somebody's skin because it's it's playing at the heartstrings in a way which is kind of daring you to disagree with it. So I I, I don't think it's like a cat poster, but it's, it is it is it is it is 
It's also not a poster which means you don't think the Palestinians have rights. It's not a poster which means you don't think that, that you'd like to see an end to the occupation or, or you're against a two-state solution. It's a poster that is calling attention to mass murder. That's what it is. It's, and, it's, I, it's not only mass murder. It's more than that. It's a poster that's calling for... F- there's families here. Perry works with them. Families that have... You know, members that are missing. Yeah. It's saying to them, "Look, this these people are missing from my house." Yeah, and I think I think that there's a difference between that and and mer- and like the a call f- like it's not there's something very human about it that is not tac- tackling any other group. It's not an attack on anyone. How, how would you feel if you saw a poster of a, a dead Palestinian baby under a pile of rubble? And and it and the and the caption said stop the genocide. You know what? I would not tear it down. No, I wouldn't think you. No, would. you wouldn't tear it. But but that, but that is Dan's. Dan, I think Dan just made a nice illustration there of what I was trying to allude to. That that is, they're seeing it as this kind of like a, of a way of uh, using this kind of horrible image to further your political. But it's point. not a horrible image. It's a image. It's actually an image of a person living their lives. Heartbreaking image. All right, so so I'll listen, I, I'm not, <laughs> I started by saying I think they should be exposed. I'm not defending it. I'm just trying to get to the essence of truth about what it is and and how how somebody might see it. Um, but it's just, it's incredibly cruel and mean. Uh, whatever. Whatever, that's the world we're living in. So um, what are you going to do? Are you going to stay at Harvard? Uh, I have one more year till I graduate. I did have a moment where I was like, I think my degree just lost all its value. <laughs> um, well, I certainly don't think that's the case. Not all, but I think in the Israeli eye, it was definitely. How, how many non-Jewish students uh, are, are, are rallying to your side of this uh, A few. Thing? A few. We do lead a trek to Israel where we bring 100 students every year, non-Jewish students, and they have definitely been supportive. Um but the majority of students are either silent or pro-Palestinian, like very loud. And is there a distinction that they're making between being pro-Palestinian and being pro-Hamas? So I think it's difficult because I speak with, I argue with people online all the time, like telling them to take down anti-Semitic things just because I don't want to see it and I don't want anyone else to it, to get into their heads. So um, I always begin the conversation by like saying like, are you like just clarify? Can you please text me that you are like not supporting Hamas? I need to make sure. Like, and you get very like varying answers. The majority at some point would tell you, no, of course I don't support terrorism. Someone was like, I don't support terrorism on either side. But yeah. like, well, this is what this is what Obama, I'm. I'm so over Barack Obama. Uh, I hope you are too. Finally, Periel. That he he said that you know of course it's wrong what Hamas did, but we sh- but it's also true. And then as soon as he said, but it's also true, he's already lost me because there's a time and place for it's also true, and it's not now. Well, at least it wasn't when when he said it. He says it's also true that the occupation is, and he used the word unbearable. Now, unbearable has a meaning. It means you couldn't bear it. So it it's, sounds like he's saying, well, what does somebody do when, when it's not bearable? This is, this is what they do. It's like I said, I, I joked on, on Twitter. I said, honey, there's no excuse for the fact I cheated on you. But it's also true that living with you is unbearable. <laughs> so obviously you are you are making an excuse for the fact that 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 you cheated because if there's no excuse and that's the end of the listen there's no excuse for that. But what about the occupation? Obama could say, well, I have a lot of things to say about the occupation, but now is really not the time to discuss it because we're talking about uh, a mass murder here. So let's not muddy the waters by talking about the occupation. And by the way. There's no, there's not even any indication that Hamas has any concern about the occupation. Hamas wants the eradication of of the Jews, and not just in 
necessarily in Israel. Right. That was my next question. Are all of these students aware of the fact that Hamas is trying to implement Sharia law, um, that Hamas... Is- Are they trying to implement Sharia law? I mean, yes. Well, how come they don't have Sharia law? They're, they're in charge of their own uh, state there, that I their can't, own territory. That I can't answer, but that's what they want. to. They want to rule the West also. They don't want to just rule... They don't want to just eradicate Israel. They want to implement their charter all over the world. Is that, from my understanding, that I'm not sure, they're... but I know if they wanted Sharia law, they could have it. I, I believe they could have it. They're in charge. What is Sharia law? All, all, like, all I know is what? is is that the terror that they imposed on Israel on October seventh is something that they have gone on television over and over again saying. They're going to continue doing this, and their goal is to take over the West as well. I mean, we saw it with September well, 11. I think some people have said that. Some imams have said that, yes. So, so my uh, question is, if, is that— if Hamas, uh, uh, that's their— Because you see, you know, there, there was one guy who was going— I think it was around Washington Square Park asking people to sign his bill to support— um, Hamas and people were so eager to sign it. And he's like, okay, I just have to read like a couple of caveats here. Um, and then he was like, so gay people get killed. Right. And, and then the, and then the people sign were like, Oh, uh, Oh, wait a second. Um, w- women have no rights. Uh, uh, oh, wait a second. And oh. so, <laughs> right. Right. And so it seems like there's so much ignorance that like, this is like a rallying call that people are getting behind. And, Without any knowledge, I mean, there's no distinction made is what is what I'm saying. I think it's important. Like when I hear people in thousands of people, like it's not like five or so. It's thousands of people yelling from the river to the sea. Like Palestine well, will be free. They're not. I, what kind of like this is a Hamas slogan, by the way. Like what are they calling for? Well, I think that's a good. I think, does it rhyme in the original <laughs> Arabic or? I, I, okay, that's anyway, a good go point. That's a good, interesting point. <laughs> um, I guess it's a, it's a, yeah. I, I don't know, but um, but I think we should discuss that a little bit because that's important. Because Rashida Talib, did she not? She tweeted, or is he that? She says it's aspirational. But but you know this because this brings us back in a circle to what we we're talking about before. So, since when did progressive people ever forgive a harsh statement which implies the murder of a group? Because it's aspirational. They would normally say, oh, that, that makes me feel unsafe. Oh, oh, you shouldn't do that. It made them feel unsafe. Now, we've had, we've had buildings named, uh, buildings in, in, at Princeton or whatever, renamed because the last name of the guy had been Lynch or so, something ridiculous like that, as if people, you know, Princeton students can't understand that there's a name, Lynch, which is a is it a homonym yeah, to uh, yeah. to the oh, name to the word Lynch, but you know you could probably handle it. Like I I can I can handle if a guy's last name was Oven. Like like <laughs> like you know you yeah you, you it's like they, they 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 were so fragile so fragile that we have to change the name of buildings. But you have to tolerate our aspirational slogan. We won't, you could change the slogan, Tlaib. Now that you realize what it sounds and you acknowledge that it. If it's taken literally, that's what it means. And you've been telling us for years about the importance of feeling safe and the importance of blah, blah, blah. You come up with another slogan, right? You, you, can, you, can, you can say anything is aspirational. It's not aspirational. We know it's not aspirational. It's radical. And I think— I mean, I'm sure there's some people that in their, in their delusion think it's, it's a call for a, 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 a democratic state in— in in the in the region where everybody is equal, uh, there there I can't deny that some people might think that when they're saying that slogan. But How come what, nobody... I think what they're saying is Palestine will be free, and they miss the last three two words of Jews. That's what they are not saying out loud, but that's the vision. But I, I do think that, in fairness, that, that some people use that phrase in their minds or envisioning a yeah, state always, where everybody is. You, you always do that. Yeah, of course. Some people might. I'm, I'm just. I'm, but that's not the general. I, probably, I don't know. What, what do I always do? I'm saying that. I'm saying that, that to, 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 to elevate the fact that there is something of everything. Yes, there are some people out there who don't know any better. I get it. But, but the people. So, I'm just making that point. Yeah. All right. I you think know, the main issue because I, I don't think that everybody's calling for the death of every Jew in Israel that makes that statement. 
but, uh, but, most but just of like them everybody are. that flies a Confederate flag might not okay, mean but, let's put black people back in chains, but you have to be sensitive to the fact that people react to it. But that's also what way. it actually means. I think I think in what is interesting is that when it's accompanied by posts on social media saying lo- things like they can either get got or leave, that kind of that kind of tells you what the agenda is. But even if it's even if it's a f- like I think the main issue is that they're calling for something that is more radical than what the Palestinian Authority is calling for, which is a two-state solution. They're aligning themselves, if we had a scale of politics, with Hamas. Is the Palestinian Authority calling for a two-state solution? Well, it was at that state. (laughs) Not now, but it was at that state. And how come nobody cares that the Jews were expelled from every single country, from Iran to Iraq to Lebanon? How how come nobody ever mentions that? Because well, they think we're most white. Most people don't know that. They and think they we're all care. white. And the Jews don't care either. They're happy to be out of those countries. Also, literally... Yes. Um, Careful. Ev- <laughs> Everybody has pushed the Jews out in, over the course of thousands of years. I got, my Hebrew, I got my Hebrew school money's <laughs> worth it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's it's such a common occurrence that no one actually takes mind to something that common. I think the main issue is the indigenous narrative. Like there's par- an it's anti Semitic to claim that Jews are not indigenous to the li- to the land of Israel. It's a lie. Yes. It's a lie well, and it's it, anti Semitic. And also it, 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 it does it's not ignorant. rhyme it does not rhyme in Arabic according to Al Jazeera from the okay. river to the sea. Wrong. So all right. Yeah, I think we and um The bottom line is is there is rampant anti-Semitism going on on all of these college campuses. We've seen it with Cornell. We've seen it with Columbia. We've seen it. Well, I'm not giving a cent more to UPenn. Not that I ever gave anyway. (laughs) But um, it's basically. But my sister, who who does have, who does give, is 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 not giving. It's basically every university. And and there should be real um, ramifications and consequences for, I mean, students should not feel unsafe to be Jewish. Like, th- that's the that's, bottom line. You, you, and that's what's going on. It's a terrible time, and um, I'm very pessimistic about it, but we'll see what happens. I... I but no, I'm yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I mean, you know, I, I feel like the, the, the Jewish community for a long time now, has uh, let us down by, by uh, uh, shying away from even teaching its own children the basics of all this and by cozying up. Now, I'm not a partisan person. I don't really, not, I'm, not, I'm not a Republican. But cozying up with Democratic politics and sweeping all this under the rug for a long time. And now, now they're, they're, they're getting their comeuppance. I, I just want to make the, the point, and this is you know, a key point that the kids at Harvard don't know, that it wasn't that long ago in my lifetime when the Israeli government tried with all its might to make a deal for the two-state solution with Barack and then again with Olmert. Legitimate, real, you could give these prime ministers sodium pentothal and you would have found out that they were very, very much trying to give the, the, the Palestinians a, a fair solution that, 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 that in good faith. And Bill Clinton said as much, who was there. Dennis Ross said as much. They all said as much. And then, as I said before, Israel was answered with the second intifada, which was murder. So this is the defining incident of the current history of Israel. It's not, and um, Hamas uh, is not moved by the fact that Israel wanted to give back the all this, uh, wanted a two-state solution. At the time, Israel wanted it. Hamas stood for, we don't want it, we want it all. We don't care about a two-state solution. And this is the group that uh, the left now is throwing in with. But the fact is that Jews themselves didn't know these facts. With Jews themselves were growing up a liberal around liberals and hearing people talk badly about Israel. 
And they're kind of not only, oh, that is terrible. They didn't know a goddamn thing about it. Jews themselves don't even know how it is that the territory became occupied. You, we asked them on the show, do you know how it is? Oh, I don't know. We, didn't we ask uh, Randall about it? Yeah, well, yeah. we expect him not to know. No, but I ask, I ask almost every Jew I meet, do you know how it is the territories become occupied? The most basic, did you know that Jordan attacked? Oh, Israel was attacked? Yeah, they were attacked, and they beat the army back, and then they kept this land for security until such time. Oh, that's different. I thought Israel conquered the land. They, you know, this is the most fundamental fact that changes the whole, whole thing in your brain. Where, where oh, I thought you, I thought you guys were the aggressor. You mean you were, you were the victim, and now they just want the land back again, and you have the nerve to say, "Well, I want, we want some guarantees of security because this is not the first time and not the second time you attacked us." Oh, well, that that doesn't sound so unreasonable. But Jews themselves can't even make that argument. And it's such a stupid argument. I mean, it's such a, it's such a simple argument. A child could understand it. And, the, and the, the, the smartest university in the world, Harvard, I bet you 85% of the kids don't even know that much basic information. And, and they're not taught it. They're not taught it in, in school. I think, I think it's really important. I think one other thing that's important is for students to understand that like, to have a different vision for the Middle East that they don't really, like, that's what scares me, that we don't share a vision of the world. Like, they're in, in this colonialist mindset, in this, there's something has been taken away, which is the idea that people of, can live together as human beings, not, and that identity is not the strongest driver of existence. Like, there's something deeper to it. There's, an, um, there's humans being next to each other. There's two countries that can live next to each other. There's two nations that are indigenous to the land that can live next to each other in a way that will like politically be reached through an agreement. Not with ideology, which, you know, like this, this thing about ideology is very deep because the, the ideology in that world obviously doesn't apply to everybody, but a critical mass of people have the ideology that is not compatible with making peace with Israel. And that, in my opinion, has been why there has been no peace. I mean, that's what Benny Morris has come around to, and that's why I'm pessimistic. It's not that nobody has, nobody wants to make peace, but it, it's not enough. The, the, and wh Now, what are we going to do about these settlers? Yeah, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. I... I so w I mean, to what extent do they represent? I think Noam, Noam, you're referring to certain radical Jews that that want to take over There's half a million of them. Uh, well, the, 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 well, they the got half million... out of Gaza in 2005. There's right? a half... They got all of the settlers out of Gaza in 2005. But not, there's not there's with... a there's a, there's a lot more uh, settlers. There's about half a million Noam said living. Oh, they're, and, they're, they're not all. They're not. They're all not all things, ideologically. Yeah. No, and they're not. Great. All, Some of them are just there because they got good a good deal on on an no, apartment. Well, they're not all. In, uh, some of the settlements, I think everybody, I think this is where the overwhelming majority of them live. Everybody agrees in any peace plan, these would be like the outposts on the border, and these are going to stay. Like Ariel. But, what's that? Like Ariel, for example. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but uh, obviously, but now, in the last year, especially, there's there's uh, the settlements, uh, the settlers. You would know, and you can tell us better than me, but they feel that the tide is turning in their favor, the right-wing government is on their side, they're using this, from what I read, they're using what's going on in Gaza now as an excuse to, uh, I'm reading about violence, kind of like a uh, renewed violence or a brazen kind of more violence. So tell what, what's your feelings all about all that? Look, I, for years, have been thinking that if the settlements are the biggest problem for Israeli democracy, why? Because they are the main divider, firstly. And secondly, they are, by continuing to build in the settlements, we are essentially, on facts on the ground, changing the ability of Israel to make peace. With every new house that is built in these regions, we're in essentially making it harder for a peace process to, to, to come to being. And in my opinion, I, like, there's also... Uh, 
military argument for why Israel needs to control the, this territory or be involved in ensuring that there's no rockets in these territories. Unlike the Gazan border, this is a strategically a, ve- a high hill above Tel Aviv. Like if you're in the West Bank, you can see Tel Aviv from it. Mm-hmm. So it's a complicated region militarily. I think that if Israel were to, like I th- I'm against the settlements. I think, Isra- I think what's happening there is obnoxious right now. And I think the fact that we have a government that, the current government is, I, I'm, I was protesting against it, obviously, um, and against the judicial reforms and also against the settlements. But I think if we want to, to, to do something about it, it needs to be within a deal. One of the issues of what we're seeing in Gaza is because Sharon unilaterally left Gaza. There wasn't an agreement. And when there's no agreement, you make it much harder for something positive to, to come to being. So when we're thinking about this war, one of the major things that's on my mind is not, okay, how do we, okay, firstly, of course, how do we get the hostages back? How do we, how do we take down Hamas? But also, what's, what's next? Like, and I think that's a really big question that Israeli ministers need to think about. So this, this, this incident, October 7th, this more than incident, atrocity, October 7th, has not pushed you to the right in any way. You still have roughly the same ideology that you had before, the same views uh, that you had before. It doesn't sound like it's, it's, it's pushed you at all to, to be more right-wing. I think, I think we have a vision of the left in Israel in recent years that the left has become less security oriented but the left for years has been secu- very strong on security while at the same time v- always extended one arm always extended for peace yeah. when israel was founded ben gurion when he f- the founding document of israel states we are open to having uh to having peaceful relations and economic ties with our neighbors the country was built on the two hands a uh, one strong and we will anyone that tries to kill us we will stop them from hurting our people and two at the same time we extend our hand openly to make peace and to have economic relations we have a really positive vision of life in israel and we want to live it so i i would, I would say two things so first of all this is you've, you've made a very very important point there and i remember having this argument with well-known people because netanyahu was in was in power for so long and that people began to use him as the excuse that people were anti-Israel, and they and they had this vision in their head that, well, if only the 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 other side would take over in Israel, then Israel's policies would change. And I say, no, they're not going to change because any Israeli prime minister has to worry about the security of Israel. And you think the left and right are really far apart? They're not that far apart on this stuff. They 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 so so you're you're right. Um, the second thing is, now this is my opinion, but I, you know, this, it's, it's worth saying that um, the, the two sides, in my opinion, are not, are not mirror images. It seems, at least it feels like the Arabs, not all obviously, but the ones who do, or the ones who are, who are responsible for the, what has set policy in the Arab world, they hate the Jews. Their religion teaches that they hate the Jews. Their speeches talk about the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. The Jews don't hate the Arabs. The Jews have all sorts of resentments with the Arab attacks, with this and that. But the day that there was some peace between Israel and the Palestinians, the Jews were like, okay, great. We, you know, we, don't, we don't have any beef with we're not taught, we're not raised to say our religion teaches that the Arabs are this or the Arabs that are Arabs or that. There's no, there's no cultural, uh, although, again, it, there may be some that's grown in Israel because of, like, the Intifada and all that, but there's not a cultural tradition of Arab hatred. The, the European Jews who came from Germany, they didn't know from Arabs. They, had, they didn't come with any. They came naive about the Arabs. Yeah, we'll make friends, blah, 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 you know, um, some of them. But the the in, in Islam, and I read a lot about it in the last couple of weeks, there is a deep hatred of Jews. And it remains to be seen if this can be overcome. So I'm, agree with I'm, writing, I'm, I'm writing my senior thesis in economics on the Abraham Accords, and which is the agreement between the UAE, um, Saudi, 
uh, so, sorry, not Saudi. Oops. <laughs> Hopefully Saudi, not now Saudi, but uh, agreement between the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan. Um, and it's interesting because we can, like, I'm writing about what economic prosperity can bring to the region. And I think that it's possible. Like, I, I'm really optimistic about this. And I want to be optimistic about our ability to work together. And I think economic conditions can make that happen. I think it's also there's, of course, political, a lot of political incentives and geopolitical incentives involved in this deal. And the reason that it came to being, um, especially involving in Iran and so on. But I think, I really believe that there's radicals on both sides. There's radicals on both sides. And I think if we can f bring the majority to come to an agreement with the majority of the Palestinian people, should they have a leadership that wants to take them to this, to a pot, to a statehood, um, I think it could be. There's radicals on both sides, but I think that it has to be admitted by both sides that if, if there was a deal that said, okay, you, you guys get this and we get this. The Palestinians have no reason to think that Israel is not going to honor that deal. They have no reason to say, well, if we agree to that, Israel's just going to attack us tomorrow and try to take it back. They know that's not the case. You're right. But Israel has every reason to worry that, oh, whoever signed that piece of paper will get, will die in a coup tomorrow or shot like Sadat, and then Hamas will take over, and now they have their own land, and now they'll just use it to, to start everything all over again. So a, a reasonable Palestinian leader is going to have to come to grips with the fact that we are going to have to allow Israel certain concessions for their security, and maybe over 50 years or 100 years we can contemplate changing that once we show them that they have Canada, as I said, Canada on their border. But there will not be a deal if they expect Israel to just pretend, well, we're signing on the, the dotted line, so what are you worried about? That's not, that's not reasonable, both because of the history, because of the culture, and because there's a difference between a democracy and a dictatorship. When a dictatorship, when a dictator gets his head cut off, everything starts over. All treaties, nothing is binding anymore. There is no, there is no memory. So Hamas will kill Abbas. And they say, we didn't sign that. That's, and they start over. So when you start thinking in, down that road of, of real life, it's easy not to become a right winger. It's hard not to become so, some sort of right winger in Israeli politics because it all sounds good until you say, well, you know, what's going to happen? They, they, they need a leader who says, like Sadat did. And we that understand. has held. I mean, that, that piece has held, albeit it's not the warmest yes, piece. Yes, it, that piece has held. I mean, you, you say you're optimistic, and, uh, you know, with regard to Saudi Arabia, UAE, and so forth. You're optimistic regarding the Palestinians, however. I think... Given what Noam just said, which sounds... Noam, I, I hear you, and I, I feel this pain. Like, I feel this pain right now as I'm grieving. It's, it's a very painful reality in Israel. Yeah. But I think the main reason why I'm optimistic is because I choose to believe that the person I'm looking to in the eye, even if they're, like, even if they want, like, I don't know. I really, it's really hard because it goes down to the chorus, like, values of humanity. Like, do you trust a human being in front of you or not? And I want to trust. Like, I want to and maybe it's absurd. Maybe we cannot trust each other and maybe we're, we will forever be in a war. But like, that's what bothers me so much on this campus, that I'm not able to look someone in the eye and say, we are both human. Let's share some basic values. Well, you could trust somebody who you take to feel like you, who, who, who answers you with the, with the same vibe and the same intent. I think we learned some really difficult things about what we value as humans, like like that Israelis really value life and that Hamas was talking a lot about the me in the media about valuing death. Have you um, encountered any Palestinians that 
Certainly many Israelis share your outlook and share your vision. Have, have you encountered Palestinians that share your precise vision of two peoples living together side by side in the land? Yeah. I have. I have. I know people like Palestinians, that. Palestinians, I'm not talking about... Yeah, abso I, I absolutely. Quite, uh, quite a few. You, quite a and few. you know them because they live. They work at some that work in Israel. How do you, how so, do you encounter Palestinians, typically? I led the Israel treks, and we go to the West Bank, and we meet with quite a few Palestinians there, and also from campus, from... Harvard. Yeah. It's quite funny that the Palestinians are a lot less radical than some of the other people. Yeah, absolutely, there are people like that. That's why that's why I use the term critical mass because it it could be eighty percent to feel that way, but that may not be enough. Because <laughs> if that twenty percent doesn't feel that way, and again, it, it, and and the form of government is critical here because twenty percent in a democracy can hold because they can't ever take the the, the reins of power, but in a in 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 a in a Different form of government, a twenty percent armed, you know, group of hunter, of, hey, uh, hunter can can keep eighty percent as victims, as we as actually is the norm. I mean, what's going on in Iran? You think you think most of Iran is sympathetic to the to the Khomeini uh, the jihad uh, Sharia law? We know that Persia was not like that. Iran was a pretty cosmopolitan place. They have no fucking choice. And the policy of that country is the policy of that country. And it's never going to change because they don't have the guns. Uh, Manny, do you have any questions you want to ask? He looks a little bored. I hope you found it somewhat interesting, Manny. Yeah, this... Uh, um, you don't have to. No, no, I have questions. I have, actually have a lot of questions. Well, so we'll one or two it might be... It might be uh, the, the first question I have is... Why could Hamas... But let me rephrase that. Why could the people like, outside of Palestine, why would people side with Hamas on the destruction of Jews, even though Jews live probably in the same apartment building as them or in the, or in the same neighborhood, and they might be friends with Jews, and they don't even know that? Yeah, I think it's a really important question. I think it's a actually really important one because... You're you're asking why would anyone with a mind and a heart, right, want, choose to support an organization that deliberately does really bad things to people who did nothing bad to them, right? Now I ask myself that a lot as well because I'm wondering, like, why are my friends on campus supporting this organization? And I think I think it comes from a deep deep frustration with what's going on for the Palestinians. I mean, these are people who have not had a homeland for many years. And I think there's different ways to understand that frustration. They're, they're using, they're channeling that frustration towards terror, which I think is not the right thing to do. But you can also channel that frustration towards, like, let's have a two-state agreement. Let's have a solution to this problem. And I think that the main reason they're supporting it is because it's they are really, really, like, upset at what's going on. And the narrative that they're hearing is not what you're hearing. And their identity is not your identity. And they let that get in the way of their humanity. And, and it is always important to point out, although it, it's not relevant to the current situation, but it is relevant, I think, to the emotional reaction to the situation that there was a Palestinian state which was supposed to be created. Yeah. And it was. And all the Arab countries attacked. Yeah, so, so, the, so the reason, the historical reason that there is no Palestinian state is 100% not Israel's doing or Israel's fault. I agree. Then, in 67, the occupied territories were part of the Arab world. And again, the reason that there was no Palestinian state prior to, has 100% nothing to do with Israel. And the entire predicament came about because of an unprovoked attack from that land. And again, that's not going to improve the lives of 
poor Palestinian people suffering on the West Bank under the thumb of arrogant Israeli settlers and, and soldiers. I understand that, and I don't doubt for a minute that um, their overlords, as it were, treat them like shit. That's just, the, that's human nature. But it is still important for people who are so upset with Israel to understand that this was never the problem. This is the current problem. But we don't really know, and no one's really explained to us, that, okay, well, if you get this land back now, what about what was bothering you before when you had it? Are you, are you over that? Because it doesn't really sound, you've never really said, yes, we're over that. From the river to the sea sounds like you're not over that. Actually, you want to take that back, and then you still have beef, because the beef is not just about that. The beef is about 48. And if the beef is about 48, then you're going to have to go F yourself, because no country with a nuclear bomb is going anywhere because you want them to. They're, if it goes, it goes in a mushroom cloud. That's the way it is. So they need to wake up about that, right? That's, that's the way it is. So, I, I, again... The, the, some of these facts are so easy to explain and so easy to understand. It's just shocking to me that they're not known. This is not algebra, like my son was trying to teach himself out of it. This is not complex stuff. This is storybook stuff. You could put it in a golden book for a 10-year-old and not be giving propaganda, by the way. But I'm not describing like, oh, some really propagandic version. No, this is what really happened. That's what really happened, you know? Yes, there was expulsions, whatever, but this is really, again, not the point. My, my question is also to you of what is the way out of all of this anti-Semitism? <laughs> wow. I'm serious. There's I, no way out. It's been, it's, well, it's, I, I don't, it's I don't think so. The, You're not allowed to I, walk around. Oh, I mean out of the, the specific thing in Harvard? Yeah, no. at, 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 in oh, university. I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I think, I think it's a— We it's, have to wrap it up. Go ahead. I, look— I don't want to believe that there's anti-Semitism. I would way prefer to believe that it's... That's the way Jews are. <laughs> yeah. Don't make trouble. Yeah. That it's anti-whatever. But it is. And we have to. We have an obligation to point to it and say, guys, this is a line that was crossed. Red line, you're far, far crossing it. Now, what I think we should do is I think, I think students who are openly anti-Semitic need to have, one, a conversation with a resident dean, a dean, a university, someone to tell them, hey, guys, listen, what you're saying there is not okay because if I would replace the word Jew with woman, with uh, gay person, with anything else, it would be unacceptable. With black person, it would be unacceptable. So why is it acceptable when it's directed against a Jew? Can I, can I answer it? Because that's what wokeness taught them. Wokeness taught them it redefined the rules. The rules used to be it's wrong to judge anybody by the color of their skin or, or, or religion whatever. or religion. Now the rules are it's wrong to judge any of these following groups. But you could say whatever you want about white people, whatever you want about Europeans. And of course, they recast Israel as white. People, and, and that's why. People have made fun of me like the, the, the word Karen always bothered me. And I don't care about a joke calling somebody a Karen. And I'm not even going to say that I don't understand what they're describing when they call somebody a Karen. But when, like, I remember the mayor of Chicago got into a fight with somebody, she called her opponent a Karen. I'm like, you're just normalizing the idea of making fun of somebody because they're white. And they, they rationalize this. But, well, you know, there's punching up and punching down. I'm like, no, that's not, that's just rationalization. The, the logic is it's wrong to judge people by these characteristics, these immutable characteristics. It's wrong in the same way two plus two equals five is wrong. It doesn't matter who's in a position of power. Yes, it, certain consequences can be more damaging, but there's a fundamental intellectual basis for this argument. Right. And they abandoned it. They, re, they, they reprogrammed it. So when you tell somebody it's wrong to judge the Jews that way, they look at you blankly and saying, well, that's interesting. I think I think I didn't realize it was yeah. wrong to do that. We've always been taught. I mean, that's what I hear every day. I think the main thing is that it's it's there's two problems. There's a surface level now problem and there's a deeper big problem. Harvard has been anti-Semitic for years. There was a quota. 
in the ni- in 1919 there was a quota on Jewish students. It's I mean, that was a long time ago, yeah. But yeah. the I think the university president uh, Gay she made a re- she came to Hillel she spoke she made a really strong statement saying anti-Semitism has no place at Harvard. That needs to be said to the entire school in an email. Yeah, it doesn't need to be said to Hillel. To Hillel, Hillel. to students at Hillel. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that it's it's you're latching on to what scraps there are to, to, to nourish yourself. But the fact is, these people feel this way. They felt this way. It's the product of many years of of uh, of uh, indoctrination, for lack of a better word, that it's that this is true, and it's an and it's an acceptable way to think, and it's not going to just be changed by somebody saying, "Hey, you know, it's wrong." Oh shit, it's wrong. Right. I, so so on the deeper level, deep. it needs to there needs to be a solution as well, and that's and we're working with the university to to do that, and I think the universities all across America need to take some very serious step to to stop this systemic. Anti-Semitism. The solution is what's that famous? If, was it Hillel? If if I'm not for myself, who who will be? You know this famous uh, thing. Imena nili mili. That's in Hebrew. Yeah. Yeah. This is really what it, the the Jews the Jewish people are going to need to have to wake up here. And they are. Yeah. And 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 they're really gonna, and they're going to have to really make it clear to the world they're not going to fucking take it, and we're not going to look the other way. We're not going to rationalize it and whatever it is. You have to put people on the defensive. What'd you say? Really? Is that okay? En- enough with you? I know. Uh, like, no, no. Yeah, you're it, right. Zero tolerance. And I mean, it means losing friends. It means, it means voting for different candidates, even if, even if they have some other position that you d- don't agree with. It means deciding that this, this is the priority issue. And if you're and if you don't come correct on this issue, I don't really care about your tax policy or even whether or not you want to reinstate Roe versus Wade. This is issue number one. Are you are you soft on this anti-Semitism? And I think the Jewish people have to. And you, you, I mean, I don't know if you know because you're not American. How deep within liberal circles, Upper West Side Jews and influential Jews are. This is their whole life. They have to be prepared to stand up and, and end it. Otherwise, there is no hope. That's my opinion. I mean, every professor at Harvard. There's, there's one thing we could say, all of higher education is, is filled with Jews, smart Jews. And, and they're doing a lot, by they're the way. They're going to need to do that. But, and, and they, but they're not going to need to keep it up after this. Like, that's the only answer. It, because if we tolerate it, it's ridiculous to think that if we tolerate it, anyone else is going to react worse than us. Right, true. They're Very go, they're, good point. They're, they have to. You have to expect the non-Jewish world to react as 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 much as badly as you know the the lower end of how the Jews react. And if if we don't, if we're making excuses or whatever it is, then of course the Italian guy who lives next door to me is not going to give a shit about it because I don't give a shit about it. Yeah, I'm really mad about this Jewish thing, but yeah, I'm still going to vote for. Whoever it is, the, because, you know, uh, I like her, you know, dumb policy, whatever it is. Most policies don't matter, by the way. Just so you know that most policies don't actually matter. This matters. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted to get a little bit to the bottom of your relationship with Perry Al. You're a, a, a thoughtful. Before we go, Manny has one more question. Uh, Manny, go yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I, well, you're a thoughtful, uh, reasonable uh very intelligent young lady, and I'm wondering if there's any <laughs> blood relation to Perry L. <laughs> no. no, I'm kidding. I, I love Perry L. But Perry, <laughs> sadly, I did not inherit Perry's humor. I have to say, not her humor, not a lot of other good traits. Are you are you on her husband's side, or are you on you're on her side? My am, the other, not my husband's side. Okay, Perry, so tell she, the story. So, um, in the, <laughs> um, it's it's a gift. It's a gift if I'm going to share it. But um, yeah, go ahead. So in the 40s, my grandparents left um, Lithuania and Poland, and mm. my grandfather was a pretty big journalist. Everybody else was killed in the Holocaust, all of their siblings. And he came to Israel, and he was one of the figures who worked with uh, Jabotinsky. He was actually his secretary, his press secretary, in founding the state. And um, he didn't know my grandmother. He married her to save her life. And they, nobody really had any money. It was Palestine then still. 
and they shared an apartment with a, another family. So it was my grandparents and two other people, and each of those people had two kids. And one of those kids was my mother, and the other kid on the other side is Shiley's grandmother. Super, super amazing woman. Her name is Talma. Just throwing a, a word out there. Talma is a queen legend. She is. And so we grew up, um, they, they lived in the same apartment together for 15 years, and they grew up as siblings. Even though they were not. Even though they were not blood related. So, But that was how we always grew up. So her, and then Talma had three kids, and my mom had me, and Talma's three kids lived in Israel, and those were like my siblings. We went to Israel every summer, and we lived in their house. And um, So Dan's right. Yeah, there's no blood release. No, blood. <laughs> <laughs> no there's, there's no... Th- but I don't have any other um, siblings, and so I grew up... Her father and his two siblings are the house that we still go to um, in Israel. So it's a... Uh, Okay, final qu- Manny, you have the final question, please. Wow, Periel, that's such a moving and interesting story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing it with Wait, us. Wait, and, and these other people here, the, the, these are your no, sister. I, I didn't even see them no. there. Those, Charlie, that's your brother? That's my brother, Yuval, and my friend, Shaked, who's also a Harvard student. Okay. Grad, graduate. How do you do? My, my, my son, my son uh, my, we, we were at Harvard uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, uh, go ahead. Um, so... We have to look at the bigger picture here. The, I'd say that n- basically ninety nine point nine 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 nine, like a such a large amount of countries, ha- m- the majority of their population are against Jews, which is just because anti semitism is the most positive, like the most normal ism is uh, and how, there's how do we you know how 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 would it be possible to just you know, stop that in general stop that i think we just have to be strong well uh, noam do you agree with that premise to to my what premise the premise that 99.9999999% of people of countries, of he, he said. Countries, he said, the majority is. is, is what would you say, Manny? The He's, majority of population. Oh, the, most people don't like Jews, and and is a solution to not be so loud. <laughs> you know, Larry, <laughs> my favorite Larry David. These we are a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think. Firstly, I don't think most people are against us. Look what Biden said. Did you see the Biden statement? Did you happen to see it? Did you see it? Um, no, he, is it when Joe Biden said that um that they stand with Israel? Yeah, that they'll support Israel. Good, you saw it. Um, so many countries, Germany, European countries, stood with Israel, and I think many for like forty eight hours. For but like yeah. forty eight <laughs> hours, but we can. <laughs> but in general, I think we as a country, Israel, we need to be strong. We cannot let our enemies do what they did to us. Yeah. Okay. People I- respect that in a certain way, too. It, it, you know, human psychology is very sick and disgusting. And um, in, in some way, I, I heard people talking about this, the, the outlandishness of the Hamas attack strikes certain primitive, gets certain primitive respect from people, which is an awful part of human nature. But I think it's... Yeah, it's like... Worse than what happened in the... It reminds me of what happened in the Middle Ages, the attack. Like, yeah. that was a type of violence. That's some Genghis Khan shit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, All right, we have to go, Okay. I have okay. one final sta- thing. Oh, a statement, a statement, a closing statement, statement from Manny Dorman, everybody. Listen, my son, the thing, my, my son's very smart. Yeah, I can tell. It. But he says stuff sometimes, and I'm like, oh, God, no. Why? And he says stuff... And, and by the way, my, my oldest son does it, too. They don't get it from me. He'll say some crazy stuff that he heard somewhere, and then he'll, and then people say, "Did you teach your son?" I, like, I didn't teach him that. Go ahead. What do you want to say? Shiley has a flight to catch. So. Oh, right, go quick. Oh, you take for the tonight? better part of like say quick for the better part of eighty years, everyone around Israel has been attacking Israel, and then and finally when Israel just puts a stop to it, now they're calling Israel the bad guys. I think you're, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good summary. I think I think it's also a little bit more complicated. And what I think people need to do 
like you're doing is to open their history textbooks and open things up and start reading and read and learn and educate themselves like you're doing, which is what kids have the brains to do but I don't know, the apparently Mandy harvard student students don't so yeah. manny mostly use, i think gets it on youtube where, where do you learn all no, this i didn't stuff? get that on youtube where do you get all your stuff it's just blatant facts for the better part of history but where do you hear these facts on hebrew school youtube where do you get them you don't read it <laughs> of course i don't read it <laughs> uh, whatever. Okay. he didn't get, okay. i think he probably got it hebrew school he thank you shyly ron you have it where are you going you have, you have a flight tonight yeah i'm going back to boston <laughs> back to boston yeah. Oh, I just take the train. But anyway. <laughs> I drive. Uh, the train was expensive because of the marathon. So okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Shadi Ron. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Manny Dorman. Shalom. Okay. Thank we'll you, see you next Ariel time. Mary Ashenbrand. Mary oh. Ashenbrand as well. Yeah. But I'm talking about our guests, Manny and, and Shiley. <laughs> Good okay. job, man. Give me a kiss. <laughs>